Hello, welcome to the THV Show. I'm your host Neil Magnuson, and this is a show where we uh, try to explore all the things going on to do with truth, hope, and change. And if you think about those three things, you'll understand that those are important things in our world that we should be striving for. Certainly it's good to know what the truth is, and uh, having some hope for change is a great idea as well, because without hope we don't, we don't do anything to get change, and we certainly do need some change. Uh, we have had no change around here for a long, long time, unfortunately. Uh, things have stayed pretty much copacetic, although there was the police raid that happened back in May. But as far as the CSP goes, uh, we're still telling the same story, and there's not much difference other than, like I say, our upcoming fifth court appearance uh, on uh, selling cannabis without a license on the downtown east side of Vancouver to uh, give people an option out of the hard drugs. And we've been doing that here on the downtown east side for over a half a decade. It's going into its sixth year now. And uh, we're still just treading water. Um, still operating, of course, because we would not stop doing that. But we're still waiting for that silly little piece of paper with some public servant's signature on it that would give us permission to, uh, to provide an answer to the opioid crisis that's killing people. It could not be more ludicrous. Um, the only thing that's uh, considerably uh, parallel in ludicrousosity, if that's a word, is that uh, in the United States, cannabis is still a Schedule One drug. Uh, it is slightly less than heroin, and it is slightly more than fentanyl when it comes to its lack of medical possibilities or properties and its potential for abuse. That is about as ludicrous as it gets. And it's, of course, because of that that we here at the CSP are involved in this ludicrous <laughs> deal with our government not wanting to give us permission to use cannabis as the life-saving harm reduction tool that it is, and everybody knows that it is, that's involved in harm reduction, especially here in Vancouver. Um... Biden in the United States has now announced that uh, there's going to be a rescheduling of cannabis. Well, that's a long overdue move for sure. Uh, he'll be somewhat of a hero, I guess, if he does that, but there's still an awful long way to go. I mean, what he's doing is great, of course. It's causing a lot of, uh, topic, a lot of discussion, uh, even amongst uh, media outlets that don't normally cover such things. Uh, there's uh, presidential candidates in the wings that are now making noises about supporting legalization and proper scheduling of cannabis. Um, but Biden's so-called, uh, well, not so-called, but his rescheduling is going to involve some uh, pardons uh, with respect to people that uh, have gotten federal uh, charges or, or convictions for simple trafficking without any violence. It, involves about 6,500 people in the United States, and that's not a very big number when you know when you consider what the population of the U.S. is. It's a, a drop in the bucket, but it is a move in the right direction. And these are pardons. They're not expungements. So uh, you can get a pardon from the, the conviction that you've got, but you're still going to have to go through the whole rigmarole of getting an expungement of that uh, from your record. And there's still a number of different uh, institutions and agencies and companies that are going to continue to use that against people, and that's what's been going on for a very long time. The war against cannabis has many, many tentacles, and it, it spans all over the place. It affects you when you're trying to deal with banks, it affects you when you're trying to deal with insurance companies, it affects you when you're trying to get a job, it affects you when you're trying to travel, it affects all sorts of different things in a very negative way. Uh, we found out here at the CSP, because that we've been charged with trafficking cannabis without a license, that uh, my colleague George is uh, not being able to rent a place because it's flagged every time a landlord checks that website to see if you have any charges pending, it comes up that he's a potential drug dealer. Uh, for me as well, when I went to try to rent some storage and head office uh, denied me the ability to rent a storage space and wouldn't tell me why, but it's obvious why because there's no other good reason not to rent me a storage space. I already have another storage space and it's for that same reason. Um, they did a pretty good job of making it very difficult to people to live ordinary, regular lives if they have anything to do with cannabis. That was all part of their great plan to annihilate cannabis off the face of the planet. 
Uh, their plan didn't work so well because uh, not only has cannabis not been annihilated off the face of the planet, but it's become an extremely popular commodity. And uh, a lot of that has to do with the attempt to prohibit it and uh, annihilate it. So here we are in Canada, where we've already rescheduled cannabis because uh, we've got what they call legalization here, although that's not what we call it. We don't call it legalization. We call it Prohibition 2.0. There are some benefits to it in that uh, now there's a whole bunch of Canadians who are not getting criminal records for having simple possession of cannabis. And if you want, you can go into any government cannabis store and purchase yourself some cannabis without any fear of arrest or prosecution of any sort. That's all relatively positive. I mean, it's certainly positive for those people that are not going to get criminal records anymore, that's for sure. But for those of us who are looking for actual reasonable legalization, um, it's been quite a blow because the populace of Canada, for the most part, the mainstream people think, oh, well, now we've got stores that sell cannabis. Cannabis is legal, so there's no reason to protest the laws anymore. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. We have not got legalization that includes poor people, for one thing, or that includes daily users and, and the people that use it for medical reasons. And those are the two main groups of people that really need legalization. The rich people, who can now walk into a store and get cannabis if they want, never really worried too much about illegalization of cannabis anyway. They're rich. They can afford it. They can afford the fines if there's fines. They're probably not going to jail because they can get a good lawyer if they need one. But most of the time, those people aren't really caught up in the whole illegalization of cannabis anyway. It always was the poor people, the disenfranchised people, the people that need it daily, the people that are, are desperate to get it and willing to put their names on lists that then become government property and then they become targeted because they're on that list. Those people are not being served by legalization at all. In fact, quite the opposite. Prior to legalization, we at least had dispensaries that could help the medical users, that had compassionate pricing for those people who didn't have a lot of money. But legalization has been a death blow to all of those dispensaries. There's very few of them left here in Vancouver or anywhere across Canada. There's now hundreds of stores that have government licenses to sell, but they're not doing very well because they're not meeting the needs of the people. Sure, they're selling some cannabis. Of course they are. And they're, they're selling cannabis to people who have little choice but to use the legal route because for whatever reason, they're not able to access through the gray market. But these stores are far from what legalization would be if there was real legalization. If there was real legalization, if they ended the prohibition, if they ended the attempt to restrict and limit cannabis, if they let it be just a plant that farmers could grow and bring to market, then farmers would bring that to market at similar prices to what they bring other things like that to market. Now, of course, Cannabis that's been grown indoors with all kinds of expensive equipment and lights and all the rest of it and lots of wages paid to clip things and cannabis that's been dried to the point where you can smoke it and losing a lot of its weight in doing that, of course that's going to be worth considerably more than the blueberries and the strawberries and the grapes and all those other fruits and vegetables that don't get dried out so you can smoke it and don't involve all of that expensive equipment. But if it was just left up to farmers, there would be lots of farmers that would decide to grow cannabis the same way they grow everything else. And they wouldn't need expensive equipment. And they wouldn't dry it out and then sell it. Maybe they would. But probably they would just bring it to market fresh, like so many other fruits and vegetables that we buy. And fresh cannabis, a couple of good branches with a bunch of nice buds on them, should be about $10 a pound. Somewhere around there. Not more. In fact, that's high. We don't pay $10 a pound for just about anything. I did see that uh, since the prices on everything has gone up considerably over the last couple of years here due to the pandemic and other things like that, that uh, there are things out there that are like $9.99 a pound for the premium cherries, only for a short period of time. But $10 a pound, man, that's, that's out of reach for most people, for most fruits and vegetables. And that's a pretty good buck for a farmer to make on what they're doing, although they don't get the full $10 a pound, but they're getting enough that they're able to pay their mortgages, pay their, their staff, and feed their families. And they would do the same thing with cannabis if it was left up to them. They'd figure out a way to bring it to the marketplace. It would be attractive to people. 
that would pay their bills in doing so. But the government, who are the culprits, the criminals, those people who were wrong in the first place to prohibit cannabis, to make it illegal, to make it a criminal offense, to use Canadian taxpayer dollars to, to hunt down and, and, tra and trap people who were involved in it, and then penalize them or, or, or put them in jail, all of that is just, is just ludicrous. We don't need that at all. We would just have farmers bringing to market another plant that people could use for whatever they want to use it for. You can use many of the plants that are in the grocery store for medical purposes. Blueberries are antioxidants. They're all healthy for you. In fact, the best medicine is good food. Cannabis is great medicine. Cannabis is great food. It shouldn't be more expensive just because a lot of people want to have it. It would be more expensive if there wasn't enough for all the people that wanted it. That's what would determine the price. But instead, we've got a, a federal government that is involved in cannabis and escalating the price way above what it should be for any normal fruit or vegetable. In fact, they think they want to take a dollar for every gram that's sold right off the top. So, so much for having it in the marketplace at $9.99 a pound or something like that, when the government is going to charge $448 for every pound right off the top, obviously it won't be in stores for less than that. And paying $500 or $1,000 for a pound of cannabis is prohibition. It's prohibition pricing. There's no other reason, no other way to explain it. There is no reason for the government of Canada to be taking $448 out of every pound of cannabis that Canadians consume. That is a hell of a lot of money. What are they doing with it? I'd kind of like to know. Are they accountable in any way? I'm not sure. It's not obvious, it's not well documented, not well posted, because otherwise we'd all know, and maybe we'd be up in arms about it. If we really knew how much money the federal government was gleaning off of the 30 million citizens that are out here, I think we'd be shocked and horrified. And even just on the cannabis file. Tilray says their sales are up. I think it's 10% or something, maybe 15, 10%, I'm sure that's what they said. So what does that result? What does that look like? How many, how many pounds is Tilroy putting into the Canadian marketplace that the government is taking a dollar a gram on? Now, we are told now that the stocks for cannabis sales or for cannabis uh, legal retail sales is down 25% just in the month of September. It's a huge decline. But it's representative of what should be happening. Because for people who jumped into the marketplace to, to invest in cannabis stock simply because it was cannabis, and hey, that must be a great thing to invest in, well, they had the hemp pulled over their eyes for sure. Because it's not a good idea to invest in something where the price is artificially inflated by tens and tens and tens of times, because that's not sustainable. It's not a good investment for your money if you're going to invest in a, a legal commodity it's available in a gray market for far less and far better quality. Sure, there's some problems with the gray marketplace, 100%. It would be best if we had legal cannabis where shopkeepers could keep an eye on the quality, where shopkeepers weren't sketchy people dealing out of basement suites or back alleys. That would all be much better for sure. Cannabis consumers given a little bit of dignity to live their lives like other people live their lives. There's no stigma on people who walk into a drug store. Drug stores are all over the place. Drug stores. The drugs in those stores can be quite deadly and toxic. You can overdose quite easily on just about anything that's for sale there. None of it's natural. It's all synthetic. Most of it's toxic to the point where they have to have long lists of side effects that happen if you put that stuff into your body. Drug stores. Drug stores. Quite common. No stigma. People can walk in there, get what they want, walk out. Nobody's looking at them going, oh, look at those drug users. But we live in a world of drug users. Of course we do. Why wouldn't we? We're human beings. 
with all of our failings and all of our problems and all of our ills, drugs can help people. Drugs can hurt people too, if you don't use them right, duh. But drugs can help people, so people use drugs. Drugs can make people feel good. People want to feel good. Lots of people don't feel good, they'd like to feel good. So they have a, a belt of whiskey, or they have a bunch of other different things that might make them feel good, but they're drugs. These are drugs. Coffee is a drug. You're sleepy in the morning, you gotta go to work, you need a little boost, have a cup of coffee. Why not? That's a good question. Why not? Well, maybe you don't want to have a cup of coffee because coffee can be problematic because it's got caffeine in it and you don't want to drink too much and you don't want to be addicted and you don't want to be drinking so much that if you stop drinking it, you're going to get migraine headaches and stuff like that that can happen with coffee. But drinking coffee is not a bad thing in moderation. That shot of whiskey that lots of people take to try to cheer up or feel better. All kinds of potential downsides to that. Have two or three or four of those and you're not going to feel very good the next morning probably. And maybe you're going to do stupid things that day or night that you regret you did. Who knows? Maybe it's just going to be a good time and you're going to feel great and that's all good. And that's an individual choice and an individual issue. You get to choose what to put in your body. You get to deal with the consequences, whatever they may be. That's called freedom. It's called being an adult. It's called having options. And the government's not involved. Except that the government will actually pay for some of your prescription drugs, give taxpayer money to the pharmaceutical companies so that people that can't afford it can get it, all that kind of stuff. We're a drug-taking species, and there's lots of drug-taking species that are out there. It's not abnormal, it's normal. It's normal for people for thousands of years to find the different substances that are available in nature they take the edge off, give you a bit of a trip, give you energy, help you sleep. All these different things that people take drugs for. But somehow we live in a world where it's been quite screwed up. Where there's everybody taking drugs of all different types and there's no issue with that. They're all available. It's all normal. It's what we do. But then there's other people that take these illegal drugs and they're deemed scumbags, losers, lowlifes, stigmatized to the, to the max. 419, you got one minute. I got one minute. The government has done quite a job of separating the drug users from the drug users. We're all just drug users. But the government, on behalf of the financial parasites, I used to call them the financial elite. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure they're elite at all. I think they're a bunch of greedy, immoral, unethical parasites that have had their way with our governments for a long time, and that's the reason we have drug prohibition on certain drugs. You know, the plant drugs. The ones that the pharmaceutical companies can't patent. Those are the bad drugs. The ones that really don't mess you up as much as the legal drugs. Because if the truth was happening, and reason was involved, then many of the legal drugs would have much harsher restrictions on them. I'm not in favor of prohibition for any drug. Prohibition doesn't work. But cannabis, coca, even opium, those drugs in many cases are a lot less problematic and a lot more helpful than the so-called legal drugs like alcohol, pharmaceuticals, commercial tobacco, those things. If we lived in a world of truth and reason, many of those things would be harder to get and cannabis would be easily available. 420 it is, so as always on the THC show, my good friend Glenn Wells is gonna join us and uh, he's gotta smoke double today. <laughs> I gotta smoke double because you gotta, gotta smoke, smoke for me today because I'm not smoking today. I suggest that we just drop the drug store and call them pharmaceutical stores. Because that's what yeah, they are. That's what they are. Right? Yeah. And then, then people will really know that maybe this drug is not, or this pharmaceutical is not good for you because of all the side effects that you can get, yeah, right? they've really got people quite, uh, quite fooled about Yeah, you can't really go to a drugstore and get drugs. You can get pharmaceuticals. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> you think about it, right? <laughs> well, a drug, uh, based on its definition... What well, it is the definition? I'm, is, I, is I don't dry, know. Is a, it's a German word for dried plant. Oh, is it? Drug. Drug. Oh, Drug. okay. Yeah, it means a dried plant. Yeah. And so dried plants, in many cases, can drug you. 
And uh, being drugged can be good or bad, depending on uh, what you're using it for, how much you're using, and all that kind of stuff, and what mm -hmm. drug it is. Uh, like they like to say, it's, a, it's an old quote from quite a ways back, but uh, many people use similar versions or, or so other versions of it. But there's no good or bad drugs. There's good and bad relationships with drugs. Yeah. And for even for the United States government to say that heroin and fentanyl have no medical value, and it's a Schedule One, they're way out of line on that. Yeah. Because fentanyl is prescribed by doctors all over the place all the time. It is a great painkiller. Yeah. It's just not good to use it on a long-term basis. basis. Yeah. Opioids don't work well if you're needing to use them for a long term. They're great for short term, you know, deal with pain. You had your leg amputated. Yeah. You got, you know, two months of serious pain. Two months is quite a bit long time to be using opioids, but it's within that length of time where you can probably wean yourself off of it fairly easy. You go four to six months of using opioids every day, it gets easy. really hard to get off that stuff because of the, the physical withdrawals are, are intense. That's when they need to come see you. And that's when they need to come and see us. <laughs> that's it. That's the CSP. That's it. That's come what, get that's some what this is all about. Yeah, we'll get you out there. The main number one thing to do with the CSP and what we're doing here is getting people through withdrawal to get off of those opioids. And the reason for that is because we've got a public health emergency where people are dying at an alarming rate from a poison oh. drug supply, mostly opioids. And they just can't stop using them. And they can't go to doctors and get, get more from the doctors because yeah. the doctors are under great scrutiny these days. So they're stuck. Yeah. They're addicted. They can't get through withdrawal. They're going to do whatever it takes to stop the pain. And that means going and getting some more of those drugs. And, and usually that means coming down here or and, having it delivered somewhere. And even some doctors were getting hooked on it because we were putting on sure. that show uh, that was on Disney Plus there. Yep. And even some doctors were getting, at it, getting uh, hooked on this. Well, I think stuff. doctors pretty famously have been using uh, you know many of their own pharmaceutical products for yeah. quite a while. Yeah. I think that's quite well known there, especially when they're going through medical school. There's a bunch of... Uh, a bunch of designer pharmaceutical drugs that the doctors have access to. I don't know. Yeah, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't know anything about that. We don't know anything about There's probably lots of stuff out there that we don't know about. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is. Just like that Keenan or Keenan, the one that killed Michael Jackson. I never knew about that. Something that makes you sleep and they put you use for surgery or something. I, I'm not with the sure. Yeah, I'm what. not sure what it is. Yeah. That you're Somebody to. else will probably mention it on, on, on there. <laughs> the truth usually comes out on this show. That's what yeah, it's all that's about. That's what it's all about, right? Yeah. yeah. I see that uh, MLB has an official CBD sponsor. Oh. So that's a good move in the right direction, yes. for sure. Yeah. Uh, CBD is good. Uh, THC is also good. There's yeah. no real reason to uh, you know, choose one over the other for which one should be legal or illegal. Uh, THC is a great medical compound that helps with a lot of different things. It's an anti-inflammatory. Uh, but the reason that it's, it's prohibited is because of its euphoric effect, mm -hmm. which is just nature providing you with some euphoria when you're in pain, when you're in distress. Uh, it's, it's a natural medicine that comes with, you know, a mood enhancer built yeah. right in, which is great. If that's the side effect of using a medicine for, for inflammation is, is that your mood is elevated, mm -hmm. well that's great. My, Rather than having your penis stump, yeah. stunted or uh, your hair my, stops growing. My or, euphoria is that it makes me forget about my pain that I'm in all day long. Yeah. Now, I've been in pain since I was like 11 years old, so I'm kind of used to it, but right. it helps me function and then deal with other stuff and not concentrate. Like, oh, I can't do anything, I shouldn't go do anything sort of thing, right? No, so, having your mood elevated means you can get up and do things you yep. wouldn't otherwise do. Yep. Uh, and like you say, it's a great distraction from the pain. It's, yep. a, you know, it's, it's a wonderful tool that's available to us from Mother Nature that uh, the man has no business getting in the way of. No. Uh, there's just no reason for any public servant to be the least bit involved in, in what drugs you choose other than to make sure that you know that some of these pharmaceuticals are dangerous. Yep. And even some of the natural plant medicines can be abused or they can be addicted and all those things. If the government has any role to play with, with drugs, it's in explaining them to us, yeah. making it simple and easy, telling us the truth yeah. about them yeah. so that we can make good choices. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. And if we make bad choices, it's not the role of government to come in and decide to, to penalize us, put us in jail, stigmatize us and all the rest of it that they think they should do if you choose to use one over the other. You can choose the one that they endorse that's yeah. provided by the people that help get them into that office that are going to look after them when they're gone. <laughs> yeah. But if you choose the one that nature provides, 
that nobody gets to make much money on, depending on how you access it, but for the most part, it can be accessed without costing much. You can grow it. It's a plant that you can grow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for the government to be involved in saying, oh, no, no, you can't grow that plant for your own medical benefits. What the hell? Who, who do they think they are? Like, <laughs> they, they seriously. They you think because I put a check mark next to your name, or, or, or I didn't, but majority of my friends did or something, that that gives you the right to dictate to me what choices I can make? And then if I don't make the choice you like, you get to punish me for that? Oh, yeah. No, 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 no. I didn't uh, sign on to that at any point in my life. You know, I, I was born into this, and it's wrong. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. It's, it's uh, I don't know. It's all about money, right? It's all about money. It's all about, yeah, and, and yeah. Just oh, by the way, that Biden thing is also not retroactive. Oh, it's not? So even though now they're oh. saying, okay, yeah, I guess we were wrong. Uh, we're not going to, uh, <laughs> my uncle, we're not going to uh, uh, punish you. You know I mean? Uh, lost my train of thought. I think I should make that go away. I, th I thought I turned that it's off. Not, it's thing. not uh, going backwards, you said, the Biden thing. Yeah, it's yeah. not retro 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 retroactive. Yes. So. You know, <laughs> we were wrong, sorry, sort of. All you people that we hurt in the meantime, too bad for you. Yeah. In the future, we'll just stop hurting people. How about that? No, 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 no. You need to apologize. You need to make reparations. You need to get the hell out of our lives, basically. <laughs> you know, I'm quit, right. walk away after you apologize and after we take all of your money so that we can make reparations to all those people you, you penalized for this. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know if that's ever going to happen or not, but uh, we'll see. Well, and we'll now, see about all this. There's what, such a long way to go. What will change at the border? All right, because so if you're a Canadian uh, who's been charged with cannabis, you can't cross into the States because it equates to a law that's the same in the States. So once he changes it, does that mean that we can come into Can the United States with Canadian criminal records? We hope so. We hope so, right? For cannabis? There's still so much that needs to change with respect to uh, how they deal with people using cannabis. Yeah. Um, this is a good step. Yeah. Granted. And I'm really pleased to see that there's been such a positive reaction amongst other people to this. Because now this will give some credence to other people that are, you know, politicians that have designs on the office to have similar policies. To yeah. say, hey, okay, well, because all they care about is getting elected. Yeah. They don't care about doing the right thing. They don't care about any of that stuff. Oh. So, uh, you know, <laughs> now it's good. Oh, oh, I just uh, altered the uh, altered Oh, the did you? Uh -oh. I kicked the tripod. He kicked the box. <laughs> That's all right. We've got a Neil here. Yeah. And he's he makes everything right when we make it wrong. Uh, we have really, really appreciated Anil helping me with the show here for oh. all this time. We're yes. into our fourth year now. He's the one who basically convinced me to do this in the first place, and uh, he's been instrumental in, uh, in making it a success that it has been, and uh, we're going to lose him for a little while. Yes. So, you going to uh, come up over here and say hi? You know, the only thing I want to say is the same thing you're saying now, so I yeah. think you're covering it. That's, yeah. you know... Well, uh, I always you appreciate free yeah. people. Yeah, people always like to Help see Canada, the guy behind license, the scenes too. Canadian government, fix it up. Let's be an example. Yeah. So Anil's going to take a little holiday. Am I okay to tell him what you're doing? I don't know if it's really germane to anything. <laughs> Neil is going to further his. Uh, and Neil, did I say Neil? And Neil. And Neil. Yes. Almost like me, but he's not quite like me. Nobody's quite like me. Uh, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> I'm trying to smoke here. Um, he is going to further his own personal uh, education and uh, going to take a trip for a few months and meet with some masters mm -hmm. and uh, that's all excellent but uh, we're certainly going to miss him. Yes. I'm uh, thinking that we'll be able to continue on with the THC show in his absence uh, thanks to probably uh, Mr. Wells here yep. and uh, Jeremiah and Cannabis Culture and the other people at POT TV as well that uh, will support us in doing this. I think it's important that we continue to tell the story of what's going on with the, our pursuit of low barrier access uh, cannabis <coughs> stores in Canada. <coughs> but, uh, that is the big story. That's the one we've been uh, actively trying to uh, to get going for all this time. Really, that is the that is the quest that we are on. Uh, right now, we're uh, we're still providing cannabis, especially the high dose edibles, to people here on the downtown east side. We have a, a program that uh, gives it out at no cost. We have a 
um, uh, collaboration with a, a for-profit dispensary that allows it to be made available at low cost. And uh, this is what real legalization would include, is low cost cannabis, so that certainly you can have pr cannabis priced as high as you want. Why the hell not? Who gets to interfere with that? If you want to charge $100 a gram and somebody wants to pay you that, then that's no business of anybody's either. Like, that, go right ahead. That better be you some know. real clumping gold. You would think so. <laughs> yeah. Or the person's got to be a real Spray, fool. Sprayed fucking gold for 100 bucks a gram. <laughs> yeah. But you know, that's, that's really nobody's business. I mean, if somebody buys a $100 gram and they find out that it's not much better than the, than the $10 oh, gram God. or the $5 gram, <laughs> then they're going to feel a little bit foolish and they're going to change what they do next time. And that's how that works. The marketplace decides all of these things. You get to learn your lessons as you go. It's not really the role of government to come in and say, hey, don't be a fool and pay more for that car than you could have because it could have been bought cheaper at another dealership or whatever. It's not their role. Yeah. If you want to be a fool in business and if you want to be a fool in consuming, you're a fool. And there's plenty of ways to learn that you're a fool and you're going to do that. You're going to be sitting there with your friends saying, well, I just got this and I paid this much for it. Your friends are going to go, you're a fool, man. I just went to this other store and I paid like a third of that or a quarter of that or a tenth of that or whatever. And that's how people learn. We don't need the government to come in and arrest the person that paid too much and penalize them by taking away their possessions yeah. and, and take away their livelihood by putting them in jail and take away their ability to travel or get a job by stigmatizing them and putting or a sign on their neck or rent a or place rent or, a or place rent a storage or, or whatever. Yeah. We don't need the government to do that. That's no. not their role. That's not what I pay them for. I'm not paying my government to use my tax dollars to protect fools. I want them to protect people that are not able to protect themselves, that are not able to look after themselves, that have problems that are something that I'd like to help with. That's what I want my government to be doing with my money. I'm, I care about the people that didn't come out of their childhood in a way that allows them to look after themselves because things happen to them. And here on the downtown east side, working with the Cannabis Substitution Program, we see it all the time. There are people here who just can't function. They can't deal with life because things happen to them. Things that they can't handle, they can't deal with. It's not their fault. For the most part, for the vast majority of people that we're dealing with here, when they tell you their stories, mm -hmm. it curls your hair. Yeah. It, it horrifies you. You think, how did you even survive to here? Yeah. Most people didn't or, ask to be here on the downtown east side, struggling with addiction and poverty and mental health. Or how could somebody do that to them? That's what crosses my mind. My, my, you know, they, they, yeah, they, they're here, but how could somebody, a human being, actually do that to another human being? Typically, it's when yeah. somebody did something to them. It's yeah. generational. It's been going on for generations. Mm -hmm. Probably the number one mental health issue that affects people and traumatizes people is childhood sexual abuse. Yeah. It's rampant in our society. Yeah. Or rape that is also rampant in our society. These things need to be addressed. These things need to be dealt with by governments in some way as best they can. But not what choices the poor traumatized people have available to them. This is ludicrous. It's like it's 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 a horrible crime against these people. We're in a perilous situation here. Mm -hmm. um, we've been five and a half plus years handing out high dose edibles and for the last two years and three months we've been allowing it for sale at low cost as well because that's a very important service to provide to the, the people that we're talking about yep. and we've been handcuffed in that we've not been given that piece of paper with a signature that would allow us to do that which is the role of government to do this what we're doing here is precisely <coughs> what public servants should be supporting we have proven demonstrated for five and a half years that high dose edibles can get people through withdrawal and having that easily available to people gives them the option that gets them off those drugs and yet we can't get a government to approve us. The municipal government won't do it until the federal government does. Yeah. The federal government won't do it until their elite parasite friends say it's okay, which they're never going to do. Because that's what the role of government should be, <laughs> is to stand up for the poor people and the sick people against those corporate bastards that, that want to maintain higher than prohibition prices on cannabis. That's what public servants should be doing, is recognizing that <coughs> cannabis, especially high dose edibles, is very effective for many people in getting them through withdrawal and off of those drugs. They need to recognize that. <coughs> and then they need to support that. 
but instead they're doing the opposite. They will not give us a license so far, over two years since we applied for one, with a great application that anybody should have looked at and approved right away, mm -hmm. unless they're in cahoots with the evil bastards that don't want cannabis available cheaply for people. And because, he, like that representative said, because other people would want to do what you're doing yeah. too. We can't, we can't allow We that. can't have that going on. No, we can't have that. that. We can't have you saving a lot of people's lives. Well, That's so fucked up. <laughs> he didn't say that. He didn't that, say that part. But yeah, yeah, I don't think that, that even enters doing. into their equation. Yeah. But we do suspect that there are some elements of the government and the corporate world that are perfectly happy with people dying from the poison drug supply. Yeah. Uh, it like appears like Health control. Canada just doesn't care about that at all. It's not like they're trying to kill people, although maybe they are. We don't really we don't know. know. Oh. What I will give them the benefit of the doubt on is, is that what they're trying to do is protect their jobs, which they will lose if they allow cannabis to be sold cheaper than what these corporate bastards think it should be sold at. You know, shareholders, the people that bought shares that are now in dismay about the value of those shares, hanging on because, you know, they're hoping that maybe, you know, things will turn around. Yeah. And I don't know how that's going to happen. You know, maybe if uh, there's enough enforcement, maybe if there's enough surveillance, maybe if the penalties are high enough, maybe they could stop the flow of cannabis in the unregulated marketplace. Yeah. No, they can't. Hey, Sadie, what's going on back there, girl? I'm not going to know where the cup is getting. Yeah. like my cup, eh? Cup flow is over. How's my little girl? Last week after that. This yeah, week I mean, throw up. Prohibition could work, or this version of legalization where you're forced into a government store to get cannabis because you can't get it anywhere else. Yeah. Maybe that works if the surveillance and the enforcement and the penalties are all sufficient that, and, and if people are scared enough that they're going to turn in their friends, families, and neighbors if they think that they might be involved in growing some cannabis that they shouldn't be or providing it to people where they shouldn't be. If they can get all those people on board and everybody's so scared and the penalties are so high and you're not going to get away with it anyway because the, the surveillance is so sophisticated and the enforcement is so on it, maybe they could enforce these high prices on people yeah. and maybe the stocks would that's, go up that's not and maybe the shareholders would make some money. Mm -hmm. But that's not right. No. And that probably doesn't happen anymore. I mean, you just can't enforce your way out of this. There's just no way. I mean, they've, they've they tried it all over. They just left it the way it was. The, the stores were running fine. People had jobs. Uh, the growers were growing. Uh, clippers were clipping, right? You Legalization know? Yeah. should have included all of those people. Yeah, they should have. Yeah. They should have. Right. All the people that had dispensaries, they should have been those now allowed were to be. making money, putting money into their communities, buying yeah. local and stuff like that. Exactly. And then they shut it all down. They shut it all down. Well, so that all the money. All there are some. There, but a lot yeah, of Yeah, well, they're, they're working on shutting them down too. Uh, you know, we had uh, uh, Johnny at the park there and, uh, and uh, Lady Marijuana providing access to people <coughs> at the SkyTrain station at Thornton Park. Yeah, they do. Um, now the cops have, have clamped down on that. They raided them a number of times. They forced Johnny to move to Quebec. And, uh, you know, oh, wow, eh? they're doing everything they can to try to prevent it, mm -hmm. but they can't. No. And they never will because it's just a plant. It grows from seeds. It's easy to produce. People will figure out a way. I mean, look what's going on in Mexico where, you know, they try to enforce against these drug cartels. The drug cartels have more, more armaments and more money than the government yeah. does. And then they help the local poor people too and the poor people stick up for them, right? Because they, they're helping with education. They're better whatever. for the poor people That's than the right. government is for exactly, sure. Exactly, right. Yeah. You know, but we shouldn't have cartels dealing with cannabis and we shouldn't have governments worried about cannabis. Governments should be supporting the use of cannabis. It yeah. should be subsidized all over the place. We're living in very corrupt times where the truth has been buried. I, I saw a meme today, it said, I followed the science and it led me nowhere. I followed the money and I found out why the science is what it is, uh -huh. you know? Yeah. The science won't lead you to the truth, but follow the money and you'll see why the science isn't leading you to the truth. Yeah. Because scientists can be bought yeah. and scientific reports can be purchased yeah. and We're they can be made it. to say whatever you want them to say. And we witnessed this for a hundred years. Hundred years now coming up, eh? Cannabis is one. Cannabis <laughs> has been illegal in Canada in another three months 
for 100 years. Wow. 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 You could maybe forgive people for the first 70 years, maybe, mm -hmm. because of the lies that were told, because how sophisticated the media was in telling those stories, how corrupt all of that stuff was, that maybe you could forgive them for the first 70 years. But these last 30 years, I can vote for 25, where the science continues to come in that says prohibition doesn't work, it increases the demand, it guarantees an unregulated market, it keeps artificially high prices, it, it means there's violence to settle scores, and all the rest of that. Prohibition doesn't work. Nope. So, for the last 30 years, the powers that be, if they looked at it, and maybe they haven't, but that's no excuse, ignorance is no excuse, these people have a job to do. Their job should be to figure this stuff out. And for at least the last 30 years, it's not been hard to figure out that there is no justification for using the criminal law against people accessing this miraculous plant that doesn't even have an overdose potential. Mm -hmm. You can't die no, you on can't. overdosing from, no. from cannabis. No. And, and you might not think that's terribly strange, but it is. Because you can die on every, everything else of overdose. Yep. Everything. Every fruit, vegetable, herb, anything that you can put into your mouth, you can die from. Yep. You can put too much in there. Call the LD50 ratio, yep. or, or uh, LD50. Is that what it's called? I think it is. It's LD50, it, yeah. but I'm not sure what the last word is right now. Because I'm not feeling very good today. The brain's yeah. not functioning great. No. And, but, you, and uh, you've had no cannabis. But the LD50 rating is what everything that you can ingest, including water. You know, for water, it's 24 liters. 24 liters. 24 liters. And the LD50 rating for round. Water. LD50 means lethal dose 50%. Oh. So if, if, a, if 100 people, average people, consumed 24 liters of water, 50 of them would die from it. Wow. Why? They would well, because 24 liters of water is more than your body can handle yeah, at one time. So. And it's, it's a toxic level. Yeah. And everything's got that toxic level. Everything's got that LD50 rating. It doesn't matter what it is. You can die from too many tomatoes. You can die so from you, too many everything. Do you think the body would let you do that? Do you think 24 it would liters you? is a lot. But I'm just thinking, do you think it would, it would force you to pee? <laughs> right? Because a lot of these... Okay. The, the so bodies, I, yeah. think <laughs> it's, I think it's achievable. It's achievable. It's achievable. Eh? Okay. Uh, Twenty-four liters is a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. I think you, have, you probably have <laughs> to. In the rail. <laughs> you probably have to consume that in about ten minutes. Okay. Well, you couldn't do that. Well, let's see. You got uh, uh, six hundred seconds. Ten, ten minutes. Twenty-four liters. Come on. Yeah, That's two point, to, that, that would be two point four liters. Every twenty-four per minutes, minute. you're going to have to consume uh, mm -hmm. well, more than that. Every, every two point four minutes, you're going to yeah, have to consume two point four times one ten liter. Twenty-four. Yeah, so, so no, 2.4 liters every minute. 2.4 liters times that times 10 would be 24 liters. If you it? got to your absolute limit, though, how good would you feel? Yeah. <laughs> For how long? Uh, yeah. Uh, so it uh, might be hard to obtain, but it's not impossible to obtain. Cannabis is pretty much impossible to obtain, the LD50 rating. It, it has a rating, an LD50 rating. Yeah, 1,500 pounds in 10 minutes. Wow. So if you could consume 1,500 pounds of cannabis in 10 minutes, they suspect you would that it will kill you because it's impossible to achieve and nobody's ever done that and that's yeah. why nobody's ever died of cannabis. Yeah. But people have died of everything else. They died from too much water. They died from too much tomatoes. They died from toilet seats. They died from wow. everything you can imagine. Kills a certain amount of people every year because they're, it's achievable. Mm -hmm. Cannabis uh, you know, lethal dose is not really achievable. So why all the fuss? Why the criminal law? Well, you look back on the history of it, and you see that it was fear. It was, it was lies that were told about cannabis that caused rampant, uncontrolled fear. And because of that, they, they got away with bringing in the criminal law. Free citizens. I mean, first it was alcohol, right? Free citizens allowing themselves to be prohibited from obtaining alcohol. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, they said it was causing violence. People were, were beating up their families and neighbors. I mean, it was just wow. the, the, the fear campaign around alcohol that resulted in that becoming illegal was somewhat real, mm -hmm. 
but the fear campaign about cannabis wasn't real at all. You know, there was no basis of fact in any of that. Uh, the fact that William Randolph Hearst wrote in his newspapers that, that somebody smoked a joint before they murdered their family with an axe, that was bullshit. That was total and that bullshit. the whole thing. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, like we were just talking about New Zealand. Yeah, right, where right. somebody there, they, they say somebody took some edibles and then killed somebody because of it. <laughs> These are well, stories that are planted, that are bullshit, that, you know, are used and designed to continue the over-regulation or prohibition of cannabis. And it's been going on for a hundred years. And they're still doing it. Here in Canada, the, the, the medical profession still wants to tell you that cannabis can harm the developing brain. So... Young people should not be involved in cannabis. Give me a break. Cannabinoids are in mother's milk. Cannabinoids are the, part of the natural functioning of a human body. Mm -hmm. when, when you're in a euphoric state because, you know, the sunset was beautiful, you just witnessed childbirth, you just had a fabulous meal, the music is yeah. giving you yeah. goosebumps, whatever it might be, that's because your body created from all of what's in it that you put in it, and especially those essential fatty acids, those mimics, those duplicates of the cannabinoids that achieve all of that. It's a natural phenomenon. Mm -hmm. it, it's not something that impairs mental development of, of the developing mind. Mm -hmm. It's something that enhances it. It's something that's necessary for it. Without the, the, the equivalent of cannabinoids in our system, we would not Be, survive. Yeah. You know, it's crucial to human health. We have a whole system for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the endocannabinoid system. And so for the governments to be making that a criminal offense, offense to possess something that simply supplements your own endocannabinoid system that will provide euphoria, mood elevation, pain relief, uh, uh, better sleep, uh, appetite, oh, yeah. all these I different well. things. <laughs> because a hundred years ago and beyond, they, they were saying that it made people violent and insane. Well, they already countered that in the 60s. In the, the, the Schaefer city. Report and the yeah, Ladane yeah. Commission came out with, no, 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 no. doesn't make people violent and insane at all. It makes people calm, mm -hmm. relaxed, a little bit hungry. Remember my friend in New Zealand told you that, uh, that they raided him? He says he's going to fight it and he's going to take it up in the, in the media also. So we might be hearing about him. He guess he's going to fight it. Yeah, and I hope that he uh, you know, uses some there. of the, the groundwork that we've laid out uh, here Five in Canada. Five years for growing a plant. Five years in jail for growing a plant. For, yeah. For wow, that's freedom, isn't it? <laughs> right. Uh, you're free. Because, because this guy I don't years ago that said, one that, plant. said that about marijuana, and it's spread across the world, and countries you got to even have it or whatever. But yeah, his, his country... Uh, and that's because they just had a referendum too, and the referendum didn't pass. So they think the people of New Zealand don't want to have anything to do with cannabis. But remember, I know people can, in New can, Zealand who do want something you to do with cannabis. Have it if you buy it from their pharmaceutical company, right? Remember, it was weird. So right. all it is is a protection racket for the pharmaceutical cannabis that's available. Yep. And I bet you that that pharmaceutical group lobbied hard to get that. Yeah. You know. Oh yeah. And told a bunch of lies that's in the long, process because they had to have. You know, yeah. it, it just, it doesn't matter if the majority of people don't like cheese. Yeah. You don't get to prohibit the other people who want to eat cheese. Yeah. You don't. Mm. It's none of your bloody business. He's asking, would like to see if you, you over there could help get my case out here. I, I know it out here also. Sure, we just did. Yeah, we just did. Yeah, I guess so. But yeah, there's, there's a case going on in New Zealand where a fellow's looking at five years well, for right one there. plant. Gazer. Gazer Mac. Yep, Gazer Mac. So yep. maybe that's a name that's, uh, you know, associated with that case. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what you can do about that, but maybe if everybody around the world wrote letters to New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. Know? Well, uh, maybe you can just give me updates and let me every so often. Let me know what's yeah, going absolutely. on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we can always talk 100%. about it. Yeah. It's a nice man. I've never met him. I've so it doesn't him. matter <laughs> Video. if 55% of the people don't like the other 45% of the people eating cheese, they don't get to say so. It doesn't matter if 99% of the people don't want the 1% of the people eating cheese, none of their bloody business, that person still gets to eat cheese. Because eating cheese doesn't hurt anybody else. So if you want to do something that doesn't hurt anybody, it is nobody's business but yours. It is certainly not the business of government. We pay them. 
So we do get to decide what is their business. Mm -hmm. And the freedom of citizens to make choices that don't harm other people is part of what we expect out of our governments, is that we're free to do that. Not a government that can arbitrarily, based on lies, decide that they're going to punish you to the tune of five years in a cage because you had the audacity to grow yourself a plant because you thought that plant might help you with your cancer or your, your insomnia. Or maybe you just thought it would help you feel good because you don't feel good enough all the time. Whatever it is, not the role of governments to be getting in there and punishing you for wanting to grow yourself a plant. Even if your intention was to grow a plant, remove the fibers, make it into a rope, and strangle somebody with it, not illegal to grow the plant, not illegal to extract the fibers, not illegal to make a rope. You use it to strangle somebody, that's a different question. That should be illegal, that should be interfered with by government. But growing the plant, extracting the fibers, making a rope, none of that stuff should ever be the, the business of government. Maybe if that's what everybody was doing, and the only use for cannabis was to extract the fibers to make ropes to strangle people, and it was a rampant thing in society, well, maybe. But no. No. Because if you make the hemp rope for strangling people illegal, and you succeed in annihilating it so there are no more people growing these plants, they're just going to find something else to use to strangle people. You know? It's not the plant's fault. And the people that are growing the plant not to strangle people should not be caught up in the attempt to stop people from growing plants to strangle people. It's just common sense, right? It's yep. just, just The problem with prohibition is it's a logic-free zone. There's no logic involved. Mm -hmm. People come to me all the time and they say, hey, this makes no sense. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> Duh. <coughs> of course it makes no sense. It's making money. Yep. Follow the money. Then you'll see why it makes sense for those people making the money. Well, why does it still make ain't sense? making any sense for the people that are getting penalized and put in cages. Yeah. But it makes sense for the people that are making money off it. It's great for them. They love it. But for everybody else? So that's not the role of government. Because the role of government is not to protect those people that want to want to have it and sell it and everybody else doesn't get to get it unless they get it from them. That's not the role of government. Anyway. <laughs> it's not. Uh, <laughs> um, Mary called me. Mary, yes. Hello, Mary. Yes, she's still baking for you. She says, um, we'd like to, to thank Bob for the uh, RSO. Yes. Right? I think I was going to do that last week. I didn't do that. Donating, right? So um, I do have his link for his uh, site, the Cannabis yes, Canada, that. Can Canada Cannabis Center. So right. I'll put that up there. That's what I was scrolling to. Yeah, if you're but, looking for a place that you can purchase cannabis online, I know a lot of people are doing that because the government stores are not the way to go. And we're not talking about legal producers' online sales. We're talking about people that actually have good cannabinoids at good prices that are not part of the government cartel's uh, scheme of so-called legalization, that's a good one. Yes, that was a good one. That's a good one. So <laughs> that's in the in the links you just mentioned, yep. the name of it, Cannabis... Uh, uh, Ca Canada's Cannabis Center. Cannabis, Canada's Cannabis Center. I don't know why I have trouble with that. The CCC. Rented lips. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> but yeah, I just remembered that we, we were to say thank you. To yes, you. thank yes. you for that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Mary... Yeah. Um, the cannabis substitution program has uh, uh, tentacles that also extend across this country. Uh, the East Coast Cannabis Substitution Program operates in Halifax, Nova Scotia. It's been doing that for over two years. They're doing a fabulous job over there. Chris Backer and his volunteers and uh, all the rest of those people that support the East Coast Cannabis Substitution Program. Thank you so much for that. I know Canadian Lumber is a big supporter. And, uh, and there's a whole bunch of others. I can't, I can't name the names. But if you go uh, on Facebook and you look at the East Coast Cannabis Substitution Program, you'll see Chris there every Monday talking about the lineup and how he served the lineup. And he always gives a really good rundown of the people that are helping him out with that. And we really appreciate all those people that help uh, with the CSPs He's done wherever an they are. Job out there. Yeah. He's done an amazing yeah. job. Uh, William Hicks in London, Ontario. 
uh, also doing a great job of helping people get access to cannabis. He's yeah. got uh, people that help him as well. And I think he needs even more help. Uh, we all do. Yeah. Uh, Chris does in, in, uh, in Halifax, and certainly William does in London. The London, Ontario uh, CSP was started by Mary McCarty because Mary McCarty was one of our main bakers here and when she had to go to uh, London, Ontario for family reasons, she took the program there and it's been running there ever since. I think they're closing in on a year. If yeah, I think yeah. so, yeah. In fact, William, Maybe uh, more. William, give me a call, let me know uh, how that's going and, and what your timeline is. Like, are you up to a year yet or when will that be? And we'll have a little celebration for you when that happens. Yeah. Uh, Mary, meanwhile, uh, had to leave there. That's why William's taken it yeah. over. And she had to go to Winnipeg and she was going to start the CSP there in Winnipeg and she did. Yeah. But okay. it's not an easy place to do it. No. Uh, what we do with the CSP has been to have people line up at a location and then in an orderly fashion get the care packs that we put together for them. Uh, in Winnipeg, uh, there's a serious need there. Uh, there's Mary, a lot of people there. Mary says uh, April 20th, uh, it'll be two years. April 20, 2023, wow. it'll be two years in London. Wow. Yes, I thought it was a little bit more than yeah, a year. Yeah, so yet. Chris must be going on three years then? I would um, say four for almost. Mm, I, think no, Chris, I don't think no. Chris is going on four years, but I mean, Chris, if you're watching, also let me yeah, know. I could just uh, check I'd like to have those suit. exact numbers here. We do try to tell the truth on this show. Scroll back and see who's true. Um, certainly the, uh, the CSP that was started in Victoria under the, the banner of Solid, mm -hmm. Uh, and I don't think they use the CSP as their logo or name, no. but uh, they started because of what we were doing here at Van Du. One of the board members at Van Du went over there and, and got the program going over there. Uh, they must be just about five years now as well. Wow, yeah. Uh, with full support of their city council and their local police department, uh, they've done a good job there as well. Uh, there's a few other uh, startups that have happened here and there that I hear about. There's a bunch of other people that uh, would like to, and I've consulted with some of them about what it takes to do that. Uh, for anybody that wants to know how do you get a CSP going, in my opinion, I started the one here in Vancouver, you need to have, first and foremost, a relentless organizer or two that will not stop and yep. will do what it takes to get it done. And then you need a handful of volunteers that'll help because it's more than one person can do for sure. And a couple more relentless volunteers is a good thing to have too. People that are really dedicated that uh, you know, believe in what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then the most important thing, of course, is getting the edibles. Yeah. So having people that will contribute edibles on a regular basis is what really makes the CSP work. You can have all the relentless organizers and volunteers you want and you won't be able to do a damn thing if you don't have stuff to give out to people. Yeah. You need to have yeah. those donations. Yeah. So you need to find some people who care about uh, the opioid crisis and the deaths that are happening or somebody who cares about getting low barrier access uh, community cannabis stores for the poor people and the sick people and, and that they're willing to put their passion and some of their time and effort and money into producing brownies, cookies, gummies, whatever. Um, the CSPs also need flour. Mm -hmm. uh, and, if, and if they're given flour or oil or butter, uh, they can then find bakers that yeah. will bake with those things. And so all of that is pretty much how you do it. And then once you get started, if you take a step in that direction, the universe will step in behind you and give you a boost and, and make it work. And in Winnipeg, uh, that's easier said than done. Of course, all of this is easier said than done. Um, you know, I mean, it, 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 I say relentless in the way of an organizer because there's a lot to do and there's a lot of uh, roadblocks in the way and you need to be able to get over those. Uh, I went and pre uh, presented this to the local advocacy group and I think that's where you start, is that if you're in a city or town that has an opioid problem, uh, there's likely some advocacy groups that are already operating in those areas and it's best if you can coordinate with them. Uh, find one of those groups that is supportive of the idea of making high-dose cannabis edibles easily available to people and work with them. Uh, I did it with Van Du here and then from Van Du I went and told the City Council before I started, I went and told the Vancouver Police Board before I started and then I waited two months to see if we could get some further inroads with especially City Council and also to gather donations and then away we went, yep. and, and so that's how it Indeed. goes. And it's um, been good. 
Well, it's been an it. incredible run of five and a half yeah. years here. We've got hundreds of people that come and tell us that we've saved their life. Yeah. That, uh, they, they now don't use those drugs anymore. Their, their health and wellness is way up from where it was. We had people come to us drug sick, obviously, and now they come with a, a skip in their step and a yeah. gleam in their eye and a big thank and if you. if you're not there, they'd have to go back to opioids. Well, some of them would, would probably end up doing that, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so even if, even if we weren't helping hundreds of people, even if we were just scratching the surface, but we're hitting 10%, or something like that. This is something government needs to support. Yeah. You get enough programs and, and things that, that work and, and provide uh, relief for 10%. If you get 10 of those groups, mm -hmm. you might get 100% of the people looked after. Yeah. In the case of uh, cannabis substitution, it's a lot more than 10%. There's a lot of people that uh, it doesn't work for, that's true. Uh, there's a number of people that they, uh, they get involved, they, uh, they try it, but they eat too much. They have. Uh, I gotta go. Kevin's having a seizure. Oh. Yeah. That's good. Right, I had to leave a little family emergency there, but uh, seriously, we are uh, we're helping a lot of people. We've demonstrated that and proven that. We have these people. Uh, we have their testimony. We have letters of support from many of them. Uh, there's. Uh, there's really no reason for governments not to support us that has anything to do with helping people. If it was, if their sole concern at Health Canada was whether or not people were being helped, then they'd be all over it. They'd be helping us for sure. Because we know how much good we're doing here. We know that people are finding a way out where there was no other. And that we are by far... I'm calling 911. Cool. Okay. Um, so, we know that it works, we're proud of what we're doing here, we can't turn our backs on all the people that we've been helping with this at this point, we wouldn't do that. But government needs to be doing what we're doing. We're doing government's work here. We're helping people that can't help themselves, we're helping people that are stuck and struggling in many cases because of trauma that they suffered. These are people that we want our government to be helping. Because these people probably deserve help, for one thing, that in many cases the trauma that they've suffered that's led them down the path that they're on was not of their own doing to begin with. As I mentioned a little while ago, the number one driver of addiction are mental health issues related to sexual abuse of children. People who are abused sexually as children have a lifetime sentence handed to them that if you haven't had that happen, you can't really relate to. But try to understand. It affects your entire being. It affects how you trust people or not. It affects how you feel about yourself. It affects your relationships and how you pursue a relationships and what type of relationships you pursue. It affects your whole life forever. There's no way around that. The only way is how you deal with it. What do you do to deal with it? Many people turn to alcohol. Some people end up on opioids. Some people end up gambling. Some people end up with a sex addiction. Many people end up with all sorts of different ways of distracting themselves from the pain and the lifelong sentence that is given to somebody who's abused sexually as a child. It is the number one driver of what's going on here. Do we want to help those people? Do they deserve help? Well, I believe they do. In fact, I believe that the people that have been traumatized in their life from either that or the death of a parent or sibling or, I mean, the, 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 the list of traumas that happen to people is almost endless. And some people don't know how to deal with it. Some people are not born with the right understandings to be able to figure it out and deal with it. Some people do not escape childhood with the right things in place to help them deal with the traumas that they suffered. 
And childhood is full of trauma. We all are traumatized to some degree, in some ways. It may not be the life sentence that sexual abuse is. But even just being born, that journey through the birth canal, that expulsion into daylight and oxygen and somebody smacking you on the butt to make you cry, is traumatizing. It takes a while to get over that. Hopefully, quickly, you end up in the arms of someone you're familiar with, whose sounds you recognize, whose touch feels good, and they can comfort you, and they can protect you, and they can help you deal with being a child, with being so much smaller than everybody else, with being told, no, you can't, about just about anything you want to do. And far more than that, we all know it. Parents that are ill-equipped to deal with children because of their own abuse as children. It's not easy being a human being. It's not easy going through birth and childhood. And some people don't have the tools they need to deal with it. It's not their fault. They should not be punished by public servants on behalf of the rest of the citizenry. Myself as a member of the citizenry and my friends and family and all the people that I associate with, none of us think that those people should be penalized for their trauma and for trying to deal with their trauma. But that's what happens. We don't live in a society that is compassionate enough for some of its citizens. The people that have lots of resources, lots of money, lots of opportunities, they don't need much government protection. I don't want too much of my tax dollars going to protect those people. Some, maybe, depending on what we're protecting them from. But those people that are ill-equipped to deal with the traumas that they've suffered and find themselves struggling with poverty, mental health, and addiction issues, those people deserve the attention of government and our tax dollars. I'm happy with my tax dollars trying to help those people. But I want a government that's efficient in doing that. I want a government that cares about those people on behalf of everyone, that is reasonable in their approach, that does their homework and their due diligence in figuring out what works and what doesn't, and to have that as their focus. But that's not the world that we're living in. We're living in a world where governments are elected because of their association with the corporate elite, which finances their rise to power. And then once in power, they use that power to support those people that got them there, rather than to support the people that are in need. And it's nowhere near anywhere evidenced as well as it is with the CSP. What we have done in the last five and a half years is proven that cannabis works for a large percentage of people that could use it to escape addiction. And we have proven that the governments of Canada and pretty much the world are corrupt, that are not interested in helping those people that need it, they are simply interested in protecting the interests of the financial parasites that have had their claws into us for millennia. The slave masters of the past are the corporate CEOs of today. And they will do whatever they can do to maximize their profits, to minimize their expenditures, to eliminate competition. And they need to be held in check, not supported in those efforts. The role of government in a free society should be to protect its citizens from the financial parasites that have been preying on us for all of these hundreds and thousands of years, from the kings and the pharaohs and the dictators and now the prime ministers and presidents who don't work for us, who exploit us, who allow us to be used as fodder and a cash cow for the financial parasites that want to have their way with us. We've fought for freedom with wars. 
We've had people, our own sons and daughters, go and die for freedom, for democracy, for public servants instead of leaders and rulers that are pharaohs and kings, for prime ministers and presidents who work for the people. That's what we deserve as free people. That's what we should have. But it's obvious why we don't. Because our power is limited. And it's far lower than the power held by all those people that have the financial resources of this planet at their beck and call. Who are networked amongst each other and maintain all of these monopolies and systems of gouging and all the rest of it. Because like I said, they will do whatever they can do to maximize their profits. It's what they do. You could not expect them to do any less. You can't annihilate them. You can't get rid of them. They're always going to be there. But we as free people, in order to protect ourselves from these parasites, have elected public servants in a democracy where those public servants are charged with trying to protect us from those people. But our democracy has been skewed for a long time because of the parasite influence on our democracy to the point where now it's blatant and in the open. Those public servants are not servants of the public and they're pretty free to admit that. Although at election time they all flap their gums as if that's what they're about. But we know they're not. And once they're firmly in office, they're not afraid to let you know, too, that they don't work for you. That you are but a pawn in their game where they are just member, representatives of the slave masters of the past who are going to do everything they can to fee you and fine you and charge you, arrest you and, and cage you or whatever it takes to protect the interests of the financial parasites. That's the world we're living in. And we have been proving that and exposing that for five and a half years now. And I've been telling the story every week. And here I go again. The CSP started five and a half years ago. It started because I recognized that high dose edibles could be an answer to the scourge of a poison drug supply. We did everything right to start it. We started it and then started proving time after time after time that this is a, an effective harm reduction tool. Five and a half years later, very well known here on the downtown east side, that the cannabis substitution program or the healing wave and the CSP combination are by far the number one harm reduction option available to people. It's well known. We have 268 members that will testify that they have used high dose edibles provided to them through our program to defeat addiction. That's powerful. That's a lot of people. We had 500 people on a waiting list after we capped it at 250. We've subsequently added 18 people in the last two years, people that we felt were deserving enough to be added to that, but every new person that we add adds a little bit more of a strain to what we're able to do here. 268 people is a lot. It's not a lot if we had proper government funding. I mean, the government's got lots of money. That was proven during the pandemic. All of a sudden, they could hand out money all over the place to all sorts of people. Some of them didn't need it at all, and they still got it. A little bit of that coming our way, and we could really expand the amount of people that we're helping. As I said, we had 500 people on a waiting list, which we have abandoned, by the way. I don't even know where that list is anymore. We have very little confidence that we're going to be able to add those people because of how things have gone. It's a drop in the bucket, and we could be doing so much more. But our hands are tied. We're stuck in an RV out on the curb, because once we had City Council's approval for our program, two and a half years into doing it, is how long it took for City Council 
to recognize it, to organize a motion, to have it voted on, and have it pass unanimously. Two and a half years, halfway through, we finally got city council approval. We met with the city, had a great meeting, had an understanding that we'd find a storefront and move into that and start providing low-cost as well as no-cost cannabis, six days a week, eight hours a day. But all of a sudden it wasn't going to happen. city wouldn't license us like they said they would until Health Canada did. So our application to Health Canada was submitted over two years ago. Three months in, two years ago this coming December, we had uh, Health Canada ask for a meeting with us. In that meeting, they apologized for taking so long. It had been three months after all. People are dying. Every day is crucial, you would think. So they apologized for taking so long. They assured us that they were working hard on our application. And that they said we would have licenses from them in early January. Two years ago, coming up in January, they told us that. They didn't say what January. I guess that's their, that's their out on that one. We don't know which January they were talking about. Maybe it'll be this next one. But the point of all that is, is that we were operating in good faith. We had tried to do everything the right way right from the start. We had alerted the different levels of government. We had applied where we were told we had to apply. When we first started, there was no license to apply for. There was no legalization of cannabis. All there was was a knowledge that I had that cannabis high-dose edibles could really help people during this epidemic of overdose deaths. And based on that, we started the program. So we have been operating in good faith ever since then. By some ridiculous set of circumstances, the VPD decided to investigate us, and when it was determined that we were selling cannabis, duh, like I said, we presented everything to everybody every step of the way, then they decided to raid us and charge us with trafficking cannabis without a license. Not orchestrated by Ottawa or Health Canada, simply a decision by a local police station to enforce Canada's laws because that's what they're supposed to do. Even though, in our case, we had been proving for years that what we're doing is helping people that will otherwise die and that we have harmed no one in the process except perhaps the bottom line profit of some of the legal cannabis stores who don't want cannabis made available at low cost or at no cost. So yeah, we believe that we were not operating without a license, that we were operating in good faith that a license was coming shortly and has been all through this. Meanwhile, we still run the program, that's what I said, we've been operating in good faith. And every day that we operate, we prove again the safety and the effectiveness of our harm reduction program. Every day that we do it, we prove it a little more. And yet here we are, faced with charges of selling cannabis without a license. Because the powers that be don't want it. Period. And not because they don't want to help people, although that might be it, as I said, but all because they just want to make money for their friends. Their friends who are going to look after them in the future and who already helped them in the past. It's all about money. Not about what it, whether it's right or wrong to help people. Not about whether or not it actually helps people or not. All about money. It's sad. It's very, very sad. It, 
does bring me to tears on numerous occasions when I think about it. And when I think about actually getting a license one day and being able to have, or, or an exemption, just give us an exemption. By the way, we applied for an exemption when we applied for our license over two years ago. We put in an application to the health minister, Patty Haydu, and to Health Canada, Mr. Benoit Seguin of the Special Licensing and Exemption Division of Health Canada. We put in an emergency application for just a temporary exemption to bridge that gap to where they said they would have licenses for us. And we never got that either. And because we didn't get that, we get raided, we get charged, and now, tomorrow, we're about to have our fifth court appearance to try to decide this stuff. Our lawyer and the prosecutor, as of our last court appearance, had not even discussed it at all. Not even a conversation, not even a phone call, nothing. As far as we can tell, the prosecution hasn't even read the file yet. Five court appearances. Any idea what that costs? There's a whole bunch of money being paid out to a whole bunch of people every time we go there. The judge gets paid, the stenographers get paid, the sheriffs get paid, the lawyers all get paid. Well, not our lawyer, actually, he's working pro bono. Thank you very much, Mr. Lloyd, you're a fantastic human being. But everybody else there is getting paid. We see Hydro's getting paid for the lights that are on in the courtroom. Fortis BC is getting paid for the heat used to heat the room. And there we are, having all of that money spent on us, supplied by taxpayers, so that what? They can waste our time, take our time, and eventually maybe punish us for helping people? That's what this is about? That they think that even though our intentions are clear, our motives have been laid out on the table, the demonstration has proved it all for five and a half years, and even with that, they think that maybe they should bring us before a judge, prove that we were selling without a license, and then punish us for doing that? Wow. Just wow. Just wow. Not only were we selling cannabis, believing that licenses were pending, but it wouldn't have mattered to us. And it shouldn't matter to the courts either. Because we're saving people's lives during an epidemic of overdose deaths. We have letters provided to us by healthcare professionals that state clearly that our program works, that it should be supported, that it should not be interfered with, and state clearly that our program is holding in the balance the lives and the well-being of the hundreds of members that are part of the CSP and the hundreds of more people who are relying on us, who won't be part of a program, who will not identify themselves as being drug users at risk. But we have been helping hundreds and hundreds of people here, and they rely on us. So for us to stop doing what we're doing, because corrupt government officials won't support us, not an option. Not an option. Not for ethical people who care. Maybe it's important to note that my amazing team of people that we've had helping us over these years with the CSP, that, uh, that they're people who, in many cases themselves, came from addiction and managed to find relief with cannabis and they want to give back. But we know these people that we're helping. We know them like they're family. They come here every four days, those that are part of the program. The other ones are coming almost every day to get their 
free 100 milligram muffin or their 50 milligram cookie or the free joint. Hundreds of these people who we know personally now. We know their names. We know the names of their pets. We know some of their history. They tell us their stories because that's part of what we do here is we listen to people. We let them tell us what's wrong in their lives. That doesn't happen very often around here. They get an ear that's willing to listen, that's going to give them back some love and some compassion and some cannabis to help them. This is a service that we are providing that we can't stop. Because all of these people who are now friends of ours, maybe we could even consider them family of ours, because that's kind of what it's like here, is because broken people need family, that's what they find here, is a group of people at the CSP and the Healing Wave who will treat them like a caring family. We can't stop. We could never stop. It doesn't matter what people with badges and robes and fancy hats have to say. That decide that we can't do this because why? Why? Give us a reason. Health Canada, if you're going to tell us that you're not going to license and support what we're doing, please tell us why. Please tell us the truth about why. Because I know there's no good reason. I know that there is no reason more important than the lives of the people that we're helping. Whatever reason you could come up with is not good enough. It could not possibly be good enough. It certainly isn't a good enough reason to stop what we're doing because a bunch of rich parasites need to continue to be rich by selling people cannabis at $4,480 a pound at $10 a gram. And that's their cheap stuff unattainable for most of the poor people, most of the people that are addicted to drugs, most of the people that are suffering from medical conditions, unattainable. $4,480 for a pound of a plant. It's not just ludicrous. It's criminal. And I will not be a criminal. I refuse to be a criminal. I refuse to make conscious choices that hurt people. So therefore, I refuse to stop doing what we're doing because that would hurt a lot of people. We witnessed it here when they raided us. They took our RV away. People were horrified. People were devastated. We didn't stop, of course, because that's what I'm telling you. Can't stop, wouldn't stop, won't stop. They put us all in cages, maybe. But I'll bet you there's a whole bunch of other people that are going to step right up and take over and keep doing what we're doing here because there's real human beings that care all around us. Can't stop what we're doing or people will be harmed. We had people telling us when they raided us and charged us and took the RV that they were so afraid of what would happen to them. One lady in particular telling us that, what, I have to go back to using cocaine to get to sleep now at night? To, to quell, quell the demons or whatever it was? Numerous other people making similar statements about having no choice but to go back and start seeking relief from street drugs because there's no cannabis available to them anymore. They closed down the blue drawer. They closed down the healing tree. They closed down the, the pop-up tents at the SkyTrain station in Thornton Park, and they're trying to close us down too. And if they succeeded, hundreds of people would be devastated. Probably many dozens of them would end up dead. And I will not consciously choose to do that. I will consciously choose to defy any public servants that tell me that that's the thing I have to do. I will defy them until they put me in a cage because I have no choice. I have to do what's right for me. And what's right for me is to not turn my back on people that I'm helping if there's no good reason to do that. If Health Canada could give me a good reason, I guess I would stop because it would be a good reason. 
If I was hurting more people than I was helping? If I wasn't really helping people, I was just giving them a, another drug that's going to harm them or something? Yeah, but neither of those are the case, that's for damn sure. I rack my brain trying to figure out what it is that Health Canada is, is interested in, is concerned about, is motivated for. And I'll tell you, all I can come up with is that they belong to the people who are raking in the profits by forcing people to spend a minimum of $4,480 a pound for their weed. Those people are behind all of this. And I'm not going to make a choice that supports them. Period. So anyway, there's my rant for the day. There's a little insight into what we're doing here. We'll go out and just check on the RV real quick because that's what we like to do. And I think that uh, people out there in the, in the viewing audience like that a little bit as well. Just a little taste of what's going on in the downtown east side because this is quite the story. This is history in the making. Two years and three months of providing cannabis. The last, well, it's only been, it'll be two years and another three weeks that we've been in the RV because we did spend five and a half months in the store here. But in an RV, parked less than a block away from the police station, half a block less than that from the courthouse, providing cannabis illegally, criminally apparently, to people for all of this time, that's history in the making. And history will be determined by the decisions made by our public servants to do with what we're doing here, we will either be able to celebrate that we finally achieved our goal of low barrier community cannabis stores, or history will be made because the corrupt government will flex its muscles and try to force us to stop. And that'll be a big story too. So we don't know which way this is going to go. I have hope, of course. This is the Truth, Hope and Change show. And hope is what drives me. If I felt there was no hope, then I wouldn't be doing this. But I have hope. And I'm not sure what it's going to take. But I do know that if enough people take up the torch and take a run with it and do whatever they can do, if enough people do that, then we can get things on the right side of history. If enough people are apathetic and just allow the financial parasites to have their way with us, then we're doomed to a pretty nasty future for our children and the generations to come. And this will be one of those cornerstone achievements of that corrupt group is eliminating easy access to cannabis for people. Because that's their goal. So they're all sitting around their table talking about how they can eliminate us. And we're all sitting around every day talking about how we can achieve low barrier access community cannabis stores. And we'll see who wins. Meanwhile, week by week, we'll continue to update you as best we can and see how it goes. And that's the story we're telling. Uh, let's go outside and see the RV. once weekly weather report from the downtown east side of Vancouver and just like all the other weeks we've had for a long long time it's a gorgeous day here uh, we are in drought uh, situation here in British Columbia we have not had hardly any rain for weeks and weeks and weeks uh, one week from today they say we're gonna get some scattered showers uh, two days after that they say there will be showers but we'll believe it when we see it I mean at some point it's gonna rain again uh, it's pretty much got to uh, we had quite a windstorm through here last night, but it didn't bring any clouds with it. Uh, but it was a pretty heavy windstorm. But now it's calm, quiet, beautiful, sunny evening. We're about to have a great sunset, as we have been having here in Vancouver. 
looking out over the ocean and with the mountains in the background. It's a great setting. And uh, here we are on the downtown east side where one block over is wasting in pain. Lots of people struggling with addiction, poverty, mental health addictions, living in tents on the sidewalks, passed out along the walls in the alleys, um, overdosing on a regular basis, uh, not dying every time, but constant overdoses going on. Lots of people brought back. There's a ton of people in the neighborhood that carry naloxone kits with them. There's people that are brought back from overdosing all the time here. Today we had a young lady, 22 years old, died of an overdose last night. Her boyfriend is someone who's constantly here and he's of course devastated as we all are every time this happens. A 22 year old woman snuffed out of her life just like that because of a poison drug supply and not proper access to cannabis. It breaks our heart. So here's our iconic RV, the Ganja Mobile, the Doobie Van. This is what's going on tomorrow here. Hey George, how's it going in there? Yeah, you can see that. Uh, I'll be in to visit you in a minute. In the meantime, George is holding it down on his own. Do you want to uh, talk to us at the back? I'll do it. It's okay. So here we have the cannabis substitution program project. It was a project, now it's a program. Before we registered people as members, we called it a project. Once we started putting people into, into the uh, you know, program, it became a program, so now it's a cannabis substitution program. And that's where you can find us on Facebook, is the cannabis substitution program. Check that out. So this is the back door of the RV. This is where people access. The 268 members can come here. If it's been four days since they were here last, then they can get what they need. The trick is to knock. And then someone will answer the door. Hi, how are you doing? And of course, the question we always ask is, what's your number? And then they tell us the number, and then we look up the number in the book, and we see when was the last time that they came. And if they're uh, outside of their four days, then they get to choose a number of different things. Of course, we have cookies and muffins from John Murray. He's been just awesome in providing us these things for a long time. Those cookies and muffins don't just go out this door as part of the CSP but they're part of the unofficial CSP. The CSP still gives people who aren't members what they need. We don't want to turn anybody away. That wouldn't be right. So we've got this thing going on where John Murray produces enough of these things for us that we can hand them out at the window to people who are not members of the CSP. So there's literally hundreds of people that come here regularly and every day they could get a 100 milligram muffin or a 50 milligram cookie. And if you do the math, I mean, four days of getting a 100 milligram muffin every day, well there's 400 milligrams, you're almost up to the CSP level, so it's enough that people get that little bit of a boost that they need to, to get them on the right track. We have the Rice Krispie Squares just sent to us by Mary, and I didn't really talk enough about Mary uh, and what's going on in Winnipeg. Winnipeg is a tough place to do the CSP it seems. There's so much of a need there, and there's a number of people who are not as well behaved as they are in these other CSP places that by the time Mary had done it a couple of times there and word got out about what she was doing, she was literally mobbed as she would arrive with her, her donations there. Um, and without having enough volunteers to support her, uh, she didn't feel safe doing that. And I told her 100% don't do that. And so uh, she's now baking for us again because she's just determined to give back and to be part of uh, what we're doing here. So she sent us a bunch of Rice Krispie squares. We've also got these... Uh, coconut uh, haystacks that she makes, chocolate and coconut, all infused. Um, it's amazing stuff. We have Green Wilderness that provides us with all sorts of great gummies. We have uh, Twisted Extra, oh, pardon me, Gorilla Ganja that helps us with a bunch of gummies as well. They've been fantastic. I, I, can't, I can't recommend them enough for everybody. Uh, Dirty Dave uh, provides us with caps for people because the caps are very important. It's another way that people can ingest it. Not everybody can eat the edibles. Some people don't have... Uh, uh, enough teeth or teeth that will allow them to eat edibles. Uh, some people just like the caps. In fact, Eden ran a program for quite a while over on Hastings Street where they gave out cannabis caps to people until they were shut down by legalization and the municipal government saying that they would have to uh, comply with the provincial regulations which would not allow them to do that. And in tears, they had to stop their program 
and quit doing what they had been doing for people. But we're still here, we've always been here, we were here before them and we're going to be here after them for a long, long time. And so we have those caps that many people came to rely on as well. Lots of other things, we have topicals, we even have suppositories, and pretty much whatever people need, we have that for them, because we've got a lot of great donators that donate that stuff to us, and we just make sure it gets back to the people. So there's a bunch of people I'm missing, I'm sure of that. Uh, thankfully, the people that are donators are not so hung up on whether or not we promote them for what they're doing. Um, we should probably do a better job of that anyway, but there are a number of people that, that really help us. Uh, Joe Pepper, for example, has been donating since the beginning to us. Um, the Medicinal Cannabis Dispensary, Weeds, Glass and Gifts. There's a whole bunch of people that helped us in, in the early days of the program. It's been an amazing list of people that have helped us get to where we are today and an amazing list of people that are still helping us today. So very thankful to all of that. And um, if you can help us in some way, if you know somebody that would like to donate to the CSP, uh, we would love that, we need that. And that goes for the other CSPs as well. They could all use more donations. Donations is what makes this work. And if you donate to the CSP, you can rest assured that your donations are getting to the people that need it and that you're probably saving people's lives. So if that turns you on a little bit, if you want to save people's lives that, that probably deserve to have their lives saved, then help us out at the CSP and we can be a conduit for you to be able to help with that. If you're sitting around listening to these reports about how many people died this month or how many people have died this year or how bad this is and you're feeling helpless and frustrated that you can't do anything about it, well, maybe you can. Maybe there is something that you can do in, in helping to either further our cause to get the government to give us permission, and that's so important to do. If you just write a letter or send an email or make a phone call to Health Canada or to the public, the federal health minister or your local politician, your local law enforcement, your local media, people that can help us get what we are, are trying to achieve here, and that's a huge part in saving people's lives and it's a great thing to do. I highly recommend it. That It's a great way to not feel helpless. It's a great way to, to join a team, a worldwide team of thousands and probably hundreds of thousands of people that really care and are trying to do something about this. We are a strong movement. We have not had all of the wind taken out of our sails. Globally, there's still huge issues with cannabis prohibition, and there's a lot of activists all over the place trying to help with that. You could be one too. You could be active in trying to make the world a better place and trying to help people that deserve it and trying to get proper legalization of Canada, or cannabis rather, not just in Canada, but around the world, where everybody deserves easy access reasonable access to Mother Nature's best plant. Why not? It's such an atrocity that that plant has been singled out and, and, and worked hard against for all this time. Get on the right side of history, get on the right side of what's right and wrong, and help us if you can. Thank you. All right, that's the CSP. How are you doing? How are you, James? Do you mind being on Pot TV? Uh, I've been on Pot TV before. You want to, you want to tell us uh, anything about how you like our program? or? Well, this is my first time. But I've really? been a huge fan of yours since we met in Occupy 2011. Right. When I, my 9-11 Truth Group. Nice. Yes, yeah. of course. So I've been... I have this is friend, your first time here. This is my first time wow. here. Wow. So I, I have a buddy who's 92 years old. Yeah. He's a 9-11 Truth Group. He's at the Oppenheimer Lounge. Okay. So our building there. Okay. And I see him a couple times a week. Right. So I've been walking by... Yeah. You know, and so I thought I'd, I'd finally stop by and say hi. Well, I'm glad you're you doing angels work, my friend. You know that we're in court tomorrow. I was, I was just, I was just gonna ask. If you have any time in the morning, okay. Come so come what's, what's the, what's the deal? Well, the deal is, is that the VPD decided to raid. Can us I move you guys over a little bit, just so we're away to, from the uh, window? Yeah. Yeah. So the VPD decided to raid us because yeah. they'd had some of their officers reporting that they thought there was cannabis being provided from the RV. Yeah. Uh, they did a six month long investigation with undercovers and surveillance and determined that yes, we were providing cannabis here. Duh! All they had to do was come and ask us or you know, stand by the window for a minute. Yeah. You know, it wouldn't sure. take much of an investigation, so a yeah. whole bunch of money wasted on that. Yeah. Uh, so now we're before the courts. Yeah. Uh, we've had four appearances already, which is all just about getting lawyers in place and eventually setting a date. Yeah. But tomorrow we're um, scheduled for an arraignment, okay. which means that the Crown has to justify their case to the judge, yeah. which they won't be able to do. Really? So I think that they'll have to withdraw the charges. Oh, so far, I don't think they've even opened the file. Okay. That's just the way they operate. You yeah. know, I mean, lawyers and, and, and yeah. prosecutors, typically on the day of, 
Yeah. We'll spend the morning going over the file. Yeah. So I don't, and I know that our lawyer, uh, you know, as of my last conversation a couple of days ago with him, had not yet talked to Crown, okay. but was scheduled to do so before tomorrow's appearance. Ah. So we'll see what happens tomorrow. Maybe it'll be the last time they waste tax dollars on us Hopefully. coming into court. Hopefully. Yeah. But maybe not. Maybe we end up before a judge and have to justify ourselves there, which mm. I'm, I'm fully confident that we can do. You, if anybody can do it, it's you, brother. Well, because we did it right. Yeah. You know, I haven't been trying to hide anything here ever. We're not trying to do anything yeah. criminal. We're not trying to make a whole bunch of money. Yeah. We're trying to help people that need help. Sure. So I think my, our motives are clear. Oh, and our see. and what we have done demonstrates that clearly over the last five and a half years. So yeah. I think we're golden when we go to court. In fact, I don't think it's us going to be on trial at all if it goes to trial. Mm -hmm. It'll be the federal government of Canada yeah. who has been extremely derelict in their duties yeah. to support harm reduction efforts during a public health crisis, yeah. especially one that's proven as we have with scientific reports from professors and doctors yeah. and researchers and, and all the people supporting us everywhere, yeah. from city council to the harm reduction groups to the people on the street. So I think we're going to be all right, and we'll see if the federal or if the courts agree with us that the federal government should be taken to task yeah. for not supporting what is proven to be a real a life-saving effort here. Awesome, brother. I remember in Occupy, you, you and your van, and you were going to the police stations across the country. Yes, you remember I did in your that. van, and it got stuck. I can't remember where the <laughs> heck you were. I was halfway uh, we between. To... Uh, between Sault Ste. Marie and Thunder Bay, yeah. in that terrible little corridor there where so many people <laughs> abandoned their vehicles. Is that right? <laughs> oh, yeah. And my mine was going to be one of them. Yeah. But I did make it home that year. It, it was great. But yeah, that's what, that's what we did the Freedom Tour. Uh, I, what year was occupied? 2011. 2011. So was that right. It's so I had, I had done stuff. three Freedom Tours by that time already, ending in yeah. 2008. And then we did another one in 2012 or 2011, and that's, that's what that was. You're a warrior, yeah. my friend. Thank you um, for all the great work you do. Well, Seriously. thanks for talking to us a little oh, bit here. Oh, uh, always. Uh, I um, oh gosh, yeah, no. Well, well, they still have the offices down down there. I, I don't see culture. Yeah, yeah. This, this, this is all. Yeah. This is Pot TV that yes. you're you're talking about right now. Oh, uh, all done by Cannabis Culture. They are still down the street in the 300 yeah. block of, uh, yeah. of West Hastings there. there and, uh, you know, still, they're actually trying to get a license as well uh, because everybody does, if, you know, if you're a yeah. retailer. And they've received uh, threats of large fines for what they're doing there, having mm. a, an open lounge where you're yeah. not allowed to have lounges. Yeah. But Cannabis Culture, of course, is a group of people that will not back down yeah. and have maintained that lounge all the way through this and will continue to do so. And maybe one day they'll get a license to have a lounge and to good? have low yeah. barrier access to reasonably priced cannabis. Yeah, that common sense. Good. Common sense. Wouldn't that be something, eh? Blessings to everyone. We're with very little of that. There you go. There Take you care, go. Neil. Always a pleasure. You bet. Cheers, Thanks, guys. James. Bye. You guys get to actually come inside the RV. Smells so good in here. I don't understand why. Can't be the people. <laughs> well, it could be the people. In fact, you probably uh, you probably just reek of cannabis through your sweat glands. I would imagine at this point. Well, I smoke about well, twenty joints a day. Twenty joints a day. Yeah, yeah. Wow, and that's what's keeping you young and healthy and smiling. There you go. I love Hello there. My, I love my weed. <laughs> and you managed to get into the uh, the Healing Wave RV here. Are you, are you uh, doing a good job? I was helping George because the, the other bag? staff. Yeah. Had what happened to the other staff? No, don't tell me. We, we, yeah. we'll, we'll, I was helping a bit. Yeah. Well, that's good of you. Thank you for doing that. You're uh, you're a big help wherever you are. Um, landlord, as you know, he's been a guest on the show numerous times one of the most respected elders in our community here and a huge track record of all kinds of involvement in things to do with trying to get cannabis legal from being the grand marshal of the, uh, the cannabis uh, march or the global marijuana march to your oh, yeah. your little comedy stints on stage uh, during 420 and cannabis day and other events like that uh, uh, the mom's cup was good the mom's cup was good the mom's cup in fact you can probably find uh, footage of the mom cup online and if you want to laugh your ass off, uh, have a look at what happened Saturday night at the Mom Cop with Landlord and Mike Rita. Uh, <laughs> you were really hitting your stride at that one. I hope you haven't, uh, you know, peaked because I'd like to see more from you in the future. <laughs> no, a couple of jokes. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, why do the natives hate snow? 
because, well, I know the answer, yeah, but, but I'll, you know. It's because it's white and it's on our land. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, that's a racist joke, you know that. Well, I'm, I'm not prejudiced, <laughs> man. I watch color TV. <laughs> that's right. Hey, and I love and I love all colors of all people. Yeah, I love and, uh, all. I love, and I don't blame you at all for giving us a hard time. I love the green the best, though. So. Ah, green is my favorite color. Yeah. Right? I think I'm a green person. You know, all of us chronic cannabis users, we could be considered green. For, it's probably just little little bits of green in our in our skin tone too. After uh, years and years of chronic use, I don't know. Years, yeah. I'm just um, I'm just making stuff up now. Perfect. Anyway, we have a lot of fun out here. Um, you have to when you're dealing with what we deal with. Uh, we do hear a lot of sad stories from people every day. We do witness a lot of uh, people really struggling with their mental health issues and other uh, other issues here. Um, it can be really taxing on people, um, and so we do have a lot of humor. Uh, thankfully, cannabis uh, gives us, uh, you know, some vehicle for, uh, you know, escaping some of those heavy emotions, maybe, that would be involved with what we're dealing with here. It allows us to do it in any case. Uh, that and the fact that we know we're doing a lot of good and that we're helping a lot of people. But this is not the easiest job to have, for sure. And uh, thankfully, cannabis makes it a lot, to, a lot more able to be done, that's for sure. Um, anyway, we've kind of uh, had a show here, I think. Um, the only thing I'd like to add, as I always add at the end of every show, is that uh, what I was just saying at the back door there, uh, we need help. That uh, we're not going to achieve success unless we get enough people helping us. There needs to be a critical mass of people that, that get involved, that are willing to make a phone call or write a letter or send an email or have a conversation with somebody who can further our cause. And so I highly recommend that you do that. Um, be part of our team. Be part of the worldwide team of people trying to legalize cannabis. It's been a very righteous endeavor for a long time, a very necessary endeavor for a long time. The amount of carnage and, and death and and ruined lives Cable and wasted there, money was that is in the wake just, yeah. of prohibition is incalculable and it needs yeah, to stop. One gram. And that's why I'm dedicated to this, that's why so many other people are dedicated to this. And uh, you know, with enough people doing that, we can get it to stop. We can get some reasonable stuff going on here. At the very least, we need to give it our best effort and try, for sure. But there is hope that we can achieve this. And, uh, and this place gives me hope, these people give me hope. The other CSPs and the other activists that I've met and, and, and communicate with, they all give me hope. And if more people join, more people do their part, more people figure out exactly how they can help in whatever creative way they have, the better chances we have of getting this done. So thank you all for what you're going to do, what you have done, for all the people that have donated to us and the CSP with edibles and things, with all the people that have done whatever they can do. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We just had Thanksgiving Day yesterday and that's what I was thankful for, is the movement that's brought us to at least where we are now, where we are still poised to be able to do this because of this program and other programs like it and all the other people that are out there. Um, I want to thank Cannabis Culture for giving me this platform for POT TV. Uh, Mostly to my producer, Anil. Anil has been great. Go, Anil is, is a, a wealth of information, uh, extremely efficient in, in getting things done, and I don't think that we would have had the success that this show has had without him. Uh, we're going to lose him for a few months. We're not sure when we get him back, but we do think we're going to get him back at some point. Um, in the meantime, uh, the biggest heartfelt thank you that I can come up with to Anil, a fantastic human being, He's going to be even more fantastic when he comes yeah. back from his educational endeavors. And uh, thanks, Anil. No way, man. I'm putting a roadblock at the airport. He's not yeah. leaving at all, yeah. man. We'd like I to got keep connections, him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He'd be, be nice, man. You're not going to yeah. yeah, he's a good man, man. Yeah, yeah, I have well, uh, the privilege to go yeah, see him once in a while and smoke one with him in his office. For 20. He's yeah. been doing uh, cannabis updates uh, oh, on some Fridays awesome, lately. Man. He was the uh, force behind uh, oh, Jeremiah's man. show, uh, Cannabis uh, News Live, uh, and all the other pot TV oh, shows as well. It's not just our show. Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier uh, in, the, in the show yeah, today, yeah, I wouldn't be do I wouldn't be doing this show without Anil. Both because he's made it work, but because he also convinced me in the beginning to do it, and I was pretty reticent at that time to do that. But uh, here we are. We're still going strong. We're into our fourth year now, and I think we have made a difference. And uh, so thanks, Anil. We're gonna miss you. We love you. And I hope you get all that you're looking for in your endeavors and that you're back in the fold before too long. And thanks to all of you as well.
uh, have have a good uh, a good week ahead while you do whatever you can do for yourselves and for the world. I recommend you have a balance of those two things. If you're looking after yourself, you can help look after the world a little bit. If you can help look after the world a little bit, you're doing a good job of looking after yourself because you get a lot of good out of, out of doing that. So have a great week. We'll see you next week on Tuesday. We'll uh, we'll have uh, Glenn doing the show. Uh, we should be on Cannabis Culture. We're not 100% sure yet, but uh, we think that's what's going to happen. Uh, if not, you can uh, go to Glenn Wells' page. It'll be there. But I'm pretty sure we'll see you next week. And, of course, as you all know, if you've been watching the show for any length of time at all, the most important thing that you do in the next week is have as much fun as you can. Right. See you then. Hello there. Yeah.